I'm going to tell you a story about how the past can help us understand something about the future of climate change. And my story begins 2,000 years ago, when China's Yellow River, swollen with late summer monsoon rain and choked with sediment from centuries of environmental neglect, broke its banks and flooded the flat, fertile North China Plain. Like an out-of-control fire hose, the Yellow River sprayed water and sediment across some of the richest agricultural land in China and home then to more than 23 million people. Without warning, entire villages were obliterated as the land became like an ocean. And there was no running from these floods. Those trying to escape found themselves calf deep in the ooze and ox carts mired up to their axles. Can you imagine the horror people felt when they realized they couldn't escape the flood? As the flood waters slowly and inexorably rose, townspeople and farmers alike perished by the hundreds of thousands. A contemporary poem plaintively asks of the Yellow River, why are you so cruel? and notes that the floods were so bad that even the fish lament. And those that had survived had abandoned all their property and found themselves now without hoes to farm, houses, and hope. Starvation stalked the land like a wild beast devouring the young and the old, the aged and the hungry alike. And the government, the government that had always been there in the past in times of crisis, they were broke and broken. Not long after, the survivors banded together to fight for food and safety. Soon, a ragged peasant army, prodded by gnawing hunger and fed with anger, marched on the imperial capital of Chang'an. And there, armed only with wooden pitchforks and ancient metal tools, they improbably defeated the imperial army. Storming the city, and in an orgy of violence, they slaughtered thousands upon thousands of affluent town dwellers. Turning their anger on the imperial palace, they captured the emperor, butchered his body, and fed it to the dogs, one piece at a time. Thus ended the Western Han Dynasty, contemporary of Rome and one of the world's great civilizations. But what happened? Mind you, the Han were the most powerful, technologically sophisticated, and culturally advanced society in all of Asia. And how did one flood in a land known for catastrophic flooding cause such damage? Well, the answers are complex. But at its heart, the fall of the Western Han was a human-made environmental tragedy made worse by climate change. And because you and I are facing a period of intense climate and environmental change, it begs the question, what can the past tell us about the future of climate change? I was struck by the urgency of this question when not long ago, I was excavating a Han Dynasty archaeological site called Sanyang Zhuang, where we found these roof tiles. These tiles are placed above doorways as a sign of good luck, and the inscription you read here would translate as longevity. The irony of this find is not long after this house was built, it was obliterated by that flood I've just described. A lesson from history, then, is that longevity is fleeting, even for the greatest of empires. And there is a context, though, for understanding this tragedy that befell the Han. During Han times, which is shown here in the yellow box, in climates were changing rapidly, but entirely naturally. But as you can see, the trend is clear. It was getting drier and drier. In addition, Han populations were expanding, and resource consumption was growing. 
Within the boundaries of the Han, it was a time of peace and prosperity. But the Han were avidly expanding their empire in an attempt to capture more resources. And as a consequence, they embarked on a series of ceaseless wars that drained the treasury and that consumed people and resources. <clears throat> the Han, at the same time, were trying to prevail over nature. So they were cutting down forests, clearing fields, draining marshes, and especially building levees to control the river. And finally, conservative-minded Han emperors and bureaucrats alike thought that the past was better than the present. And they turned increasingly to the past for solutions to the present-day problems, and it didn't work out well. As a consequence, by the beginning of the Common Era, the Han Dynasty was a shadow of its former self, the coffers were empty, and the government was paralyzed. And one place we can see this process playing out is in the Yellow River itself. The Yellow River is one of the world's great rivers, and it's the heart of Chinese civilization. But the Yellow River is actually a funny river, because it's very water poor, but sediment rich. And some of this is because it flows through a dry part of China, and also because it passes through the Lost Plateau, which is an area of thick, rich, but very easily eroded sediment. Now, when I say sediment rich, let me give you an example. The way we measure sediment content in a river is to take a cubic meter of water out of the river, sort of extract it from the river, take the water away, and you weigh the remaining sediment. So if I do this, for instance, in the Mississippi River, I might get four to six pounds of sediment. If I take a cubic meter of water out of the Amazon River, I might get 20 to 40 pounds of sediment. But if I take a cubic meter of water out of the Yellow River at flood, I get almost 800 pounds of sediment. At sediment concentrations like this, it's no longer a river. It's simply a flowing landslide. And the reason for this is because as it's getting drier, there's less vegetation to hold the soil in place. And as there are more mouths to feed, the Han have to intensify agriculture, particularly on the Lost Plateau. And as drought is increasing and agriculture is becoming more intensive, more and more sediment is flowing into the Yellow River. And because the Han were trying to prevail over nature, they had built up big levees, so the sediment had nowhere to go. So the bed of the river started to rise, which meant the Han had to build their levees higher, which meant the bed of the river rose in an endless cycle. But as the bed of the river is going up and the levees were keeping pace, the land behind the levees was effectively sinking and becoming lower than the bed of the river. For example, at Sanyang Zhuang, at the time of that flood, the site was 10 feet below the bed of the river. This meant it was not a matter of if there was going to be a catastrophic flood. It was simply a matter of when and how bad it would be. And for the Han, the end came quickly. Here we see the last pathetic events in the life of the village of Sanyang Zhuang as a farmer up to his ankles in the mud, scrambles desperately to gather the last of the harvest before the site was inundated. But for the farmer, for the village, and for the empire, it was too little, too late. Now, what does this have to do with the present or the future, for that matter of fact? Well, one important point of comparison is that, like the Han, we are facing a period of unprecedented climate change. Although for us, these changes are caused entirely by humans. But the long-term trend is entirely clear. It's getting warmer and warmer. As you can see here, <clears throat> we're adding greenhouse gases, especially CO2, to the atmosphere at an alarming rate. Greenhouse gases trap heat and warm the planet. The more greenhouse gases we add, the warmer the planet will become. We just passed 
400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere as our annual average. That's a level of CO2 not seen on Earth for at least the last four to five million years, and a level of CO2 never experienced by members of our species. You and I and our children and our children's children will never see CO2 below 400 parts per million. We're entering new territory here, and not in a good way. And as a result of changing the atmosphere, we're changing the climate, and we're feeling the effects. What we're seeing is, is that it's getting wetter and hotter through time. And like the Han, we have invested a great deal of money in an infrastructure that isn't designed to handle the kinds of climate change we're seeing. Our infrastructure, our electrical grid, our roads, our bridges, our sewers, our water treatment plants, they were not designed to handle 500-year floods that are now happening every 20 years, or 100-year floods that happen every five years. Hurricane Sandy is a good or maybe a bad example of this. Sandy, which happened in 2012, was actually a pretty minor storm. There have been a lot worse that have hit the Northeast. But Hurricane Sandy overwhelmed the infrastructure of the metro New York area and caused extensive damage both locally and because of New York's significance, even nationally. How could one small storm cause such damage? Well, the main reason is because people didn't believe it could happen, so they didn't prepare. But of course, we know Sandy happened. And the scary thing is we know that hurricane frequency is going to, and intensity is going to increase under new climate conditions. Like the Yellow River in Han times, it's not a matter of if there will be another Hurricane Sandy. It's simply a matter of when and how bad it's going to be. Jumping back to China for a moment, during Han times there was a vigorous debate about how to manage the Yellow River, and it came down to whether we would work with nature or work against nature. Some engineers believed in building low levees set far apart to let the river flow in its floodplain, and they believed that it was acceptable to have some flooding today to prevent catastrophe tomorrow. But as we've seen, the Han government wanted to prevail over nature, so they built big levees, and tried to control the river. But we can see this same philosophical debate playing out today in attempts to cope with climate change. So, for example, following Hurricane Sandy, there was a set of proposals to build a wall across the mouth of New York City Harbor. For a mere eight to ten billion dollars, we can protect New York City from a Sandy-like storm. But even if we can afford to do this, do we want to do this? Because one thing I can tell you is that building that wall isn't going to make the storm go away, and it's not going to make the storm surge go away. All we're going to do is take that water and move it somewhere else along the coast and make it somebody else's problem. Now, I don't think that hurricanes or droughts or floods are going to destroy America, or at least I sure hope not. But the fact of the matter is, is that climate change is real, and it's here. Mitigation alone, all the Paris Accords we want to sign, are not going to stop the notable effects of climate change. All we can do now is slow down the rate of that kind of climate change. We will see, indeed we are seeing, severe climate events that are as bad or worse than Sandy, and it's only going to get worse. What can the past then tell us about climate change? The China case study tells us that the Han never anticipated their own downfall. 2,000 years ago, the Han government didn't plan or prepare in the face of changing climates. 
Instead, they look backwards. And as a result, hundreds of thousands of people needlessly died. Sadly, failure is an option. Over and over in my research, I've seen humans try to prevail over nature, and it doesn't work out well. But whether it's the Han or Hurricane Sandy, the real issue is human arrogance. People don't believe that climate change can cause these problems, so we don't adapt to it. But I think we can learn from the Han example. For instance, we must resist calls to build our levees higher. We need to let our streams and rivers flow in their floodplain and not try to constrain them. And we need to accept some loss today to prevent catastrophe tomorrow. But more than anything else, we need to plan and prepare. Because in today's world of rapid human-made cha climate change, not a matter of if there will be another climate catastrophe. It's simply a matter of when and how bad it will be. We must plan. We must prepare. We must adapt to climate change. Especially we need to live in the present. Because if we don't, if we don't, will be like that farmer from 2,000 years ago, stuck in the mud, unable to stop the rising water, and scrambling desperately to save our friends, our family, and ourselves.